If you want to be efficient and effective with your system tuning, you need to be familiar with the tools and know how to read the data quickly and translate that into results. So it's a three part problem. Know how to drive the car, know where you're going and know why and how to solve problems. So today I thought it'd be fun to do a five question quiz on reading measurement data. So if you probably heard me before use the analogy of you are an x-ray technician, you are a radiologist and you are a surgeon. An x-ray technician captures the data and knows how to operate the machine. The radi the radiologist looks at the fractured bones, and then the surgeon actually solves the problem. So we're going to focus on this middle one today, being a radiologist. How can we read the data that's captured? So I'm going to run through five questions and give you a little bit of time. You can pause the video if you want and think about it, uh, starting a little bit easier and increasing in difficulty as we go. Today I'm working in Smart LE. You, of course, can use any analyzer you would like. This is my one of choice, but let's get right to it. So first up, what change did I make to this measurement signal? I'm going to be using a separate processor that you can't see, so you can't cheat. And I'm going to be adding some type of process to this. What change just by looking at these three graphs, the top, the impulse response, the phase graph, and the magnitude graph. All right, here we go. Question one, what changed? Okay, I'm gonna undo it, put it back to where it was. Now I'm gonna put in the process. What changed? All right, the correct answer is our measurement signal decreased in level 9 dB. And how was it able to tell that? Three places that at least told us there was a decline in level. The impulse response spike shrank I saw my measurement signal over here go down. And then here on the magnitude graph, I saw this line globally go down. So this is not an EQ move because EQ adjusts specific frequency ranges, but it was a global level change of 9 dB. And how I knew is that I saw right here, this was in line at 9 dB. Okay, question one, let me put it back to where it was. All right, question two, again, is what change did I make to the measurement signal? So I'm gonna engage a different type of process and let's see what changed. Here we go, here's our starting point, here's the change. All right, give you a second to look at the graph, or multiple graphs here. I'm gonna bring it back. Okay. Bring it in. Okay, so let's talk about this. How am I to figure this out? Nothing changed with the magnitude graph. Okay, so that means nothing changed with level and nothing changed with the actual uh, change in level over frequency either. Moving up here to phase, definitely saw a change in phase. Remember, a transfer function is comparing two things. So it's comparing a measurement to a reference. So my measurement signal is different timing wise. And I can also see this at the very top. So my impulse response shifted to the right, meaning it's, and now it's later. And we can also see that it is later because my phase graph is sloping downwards. If it was flat, it would be on time. If it was sloping upwards from left to right, it would be ahead. So the clues I'm seeing here is that there's a delay of some kind, but how much? So it is one millisecond of delay. And how did I figure that out? So um, I know you're not driving the software right now, but I could put my cursor right here over the spike and see at the top that it shows me one millisecond of a delay in green up there. So that's how much it shifted. And then also the only thing I had to look at was the phase graph. So if I go here and just look at phase and hide my impulse response, I can see here that at 500 Hertz, is where I see this wrap occurring, or uh, also called a, a bar or rack, if you will. And so 500 here is where I am 180 degrees uh, of phase shift. And so 180 degrees of phase shift means I'm halfway through a cycle. So if I double that, that will get me to 1K. And I see that is at the zero degree mark. If I go here, a full cycle, 
goes all the way through and lands, boom, right back there at 1K. And I know that 1K is one milliseconds of cycle time, one millisecond of cycle time to complete a full period. So that is 1K. So that I was able to tell that is one millisecond of delay. Moving on to question three, I've now stopped my live measurement and I've pulled up a stored measurement and I'm calling it frequency in time because the questions I'm asking is in what frequency range is my measurement, this capture in time with the reference signal. So when we are syncing something up between measurement and reference, there could be a change over frequency and that's what the phase graph shows us. So I'm asking in what frequency range is this trace in time? Our magnitude graph isn't gonna be able to tell us that. We can maybe get some data from the impulse response up here, but it's mostly gonna be within our phase graph. So let me zoom in here to give us a little bit better look at this impulse. So I'm looking here and I see it is latched onto or made time zero, this spike right here, and that's gonna be latching onto high frequencies. Okay, so that's a little bit of a clue. And like I mentioned earlier, the phase graph is gonna tell us timing over frequency. And we know when it's sloping downward from left to right that we are lagging in time, so it is behind. So when it starts to flatten out, and then here's where the answer's coming, that is where we are in time. So the answer to this question is about four to 8K onwards up to 16K. So we see a little bit of variance over that, but in general, it is flat. So that corresponds with this high frequency spike that we see up here. Some of you have asked, well, I have a hard time finding that spike when I'm measuring subwoofers. And that's why They're, the wavelengths are long and it's not able to find this nice spike to latch onto. So the delay finder or the tracker is gonna go all over, all over the place. There are ways around this and ways to use a, a frequency specific delay finder outside the scope of this video. But this is where it is latched onto and syncing up our measurement and references. That spike is corresponding with this energy that's on time. So speakers, loudspeakers, especially in a live environment in general, because of uh, the filtering used to protect them and crossovers in between high, mid, and low drivers, we're going to exhibit some type of phase shift over frequency. And that's perfectly fine. This is actually a studio speaker I measured here in my room. So nothing to be alarmed at here. Uh, we don't necessarily need to fix it. We can do some type of fancy pants processing with FIR filters, but you incur some delay. All that being said, this is where we're on time. How do I know that? This is where the phase trace is flat. Moving on to question number four, I'm gonna hide our impulse response up top because it's not showing us a whole lot up here. We're gonna be looking at the phase graph and magnitude graph. And I'm asking which of these two traces is lagging more compared to our reference signal. So I have lag A in yellow and I have B in this nice magenta color, channeling my best Bob Ross here. So if I go back and forth, I can see that they start here pretty even and, but deviate and one starts to slope down more. Hmm, okay, so going earlier. So if I know that sloping downward is lagging, I can look at the one that has a steeper slope and that will tell me which one might be more behind. So I can tell you, great, lag B starts sloping down steeper sooner Therefore, it has more delay at lower frequencies, so it is farther behind. So just, just wanna, wanna back up and go through that. On the phase graph, reading from left to right, if it is sloping downward, that is more delay. So I can see it even has more wraps happening sooner. That's another way you can look. They actually cross over here and are in time at just that frequency, then deviate. But that's how I'm figuring that out. That is sloping downward at a steeper angle from left to right. That's how I know it is lagging more. Why would this be handy to know? Maybe you're wanting to align main and subs. Maybe they're mismatched speaker brands. You have no idea what process is in front of them. So even if you have mains in the air, subs on the floor, you can't guarantee one is gonna be ahead or behind. So you would place the microphone where you want to align them, usually about 75% of the way back in the audience, as a general rule of thumb. I would solo my mains, capture that, then turn off my mains, solo my subs, do not change your delay tracker at this point, see it, and then see which of the face traces in the area of interest, probably between 63 and 125, 
is steeper. And we're going to need to delay the one to get it as steep as the other one to align it in time. We may need to use all pass filters or some other processes, fine tune the high pass and low pass or crossover uh, to get that fully aligned. But in general, at a macro timing level, we want to be able to delay it to get them to line up. Here we go. Last question number five. When two correlated signals are offset in time, so we have one and then a copy of itself maybe arriving later, when they combine, they create a cone filter. This could be due to reflection, a floor bounce. Here I've artificially made one by simply making a copy of a signal and delaying it. Now I'm asking you from looking at this graph, how much time in milliseconds is the second signal delayed? We could be cheaters, or just the first place I'd look for this is in the impulse response graph, but I wanna see if you can figure it out just by looking at the phase graph and magnitude graph here. Okay, give, give you a little bit of time to look. Now I'll introduce some clues. What I'm noticing here is that we have a classic comb filter and why it's called that is this looks like a comb of these teeth moving. And then this also corresponds with some cancellations here on the phase graph. So those line up. So comb filters always make the same pattern. When it's, a, again, a correlated signal combining with itself, we can see these patterns move. And we can see the first dip in a comb filter is going to happen when those two signals at that frequency are 180 degrees out of phase. So this is a good clue to look for of like, okay, where indeed is this first dip? So I could put my cursor here and move it and line it up where this little spike is right here, where we lose coherence and we're losing coherence because there's so much cancellation that there's no more signal left for it to really compare the two. So it just assumes there's no signal there, which means low coherence. So I'm moving this here. And so that looks like at about a hundred Hertz, there is that big dip. So we know a couple things about 100 Hertz. We could translate that into wavelength, which is 11.3 uh, feet. We can also convert that to cycle time in milliseconds. And that is taking one over frequency times a thousand. So that is one divided by 100 times a thousand. And that gets us to 10 milliseconds. So that's how much delay it, uh, that's how much time it takes for a full cycle. So what makes a cancellation when we are 180 degrees out of phase or half of that cycle? So if I take that and that's 10 divided by two is five milliseconds. So that's how I figured out how much delay causes this comb filter. And now if I bring up the impulse response, I can go here and look, there's our time zero. And we see a nice copy and a spike of it right there at five milliseconds to confirm that. And with that, we see these regular cancellations over frequency. So that's here again at uh, 300 Hertz. And then we have 500 Hertz, 700 Hertz. So that's actually a spacing of 200 Hertz each time. So basically we have a 200 Hertz comb is another way to say, say it. And so that's the other way we can solve this is what is the spacing? So that spacing is 200 Hertz and what, uh, cycle time corresponds with 200 hertz and that is five milliseconds so those are two different ways of solving the same problem is either looking at the first big cancellation and figure out half of that because it's 180 degrees out of phase or we can look at the spacing and see how that repeats and translate that into cycle time as well all right i thought that was a lot of fun i think it's important for you to be fluid with your tools themselves and how to read the data so you can move quickly in the field and get great sounding results. If you like this style of video, please let me know. Um, it was fun for me to put together. Appreciate your time. I'll catch you next time.